Hello, welcome to the next session. This session is called A Circular Economy World of Creation. In a world in which we are used to creating a huge amount, this session focuses on how do we reuse and recycle waste for better for better use, such that we're not creating so much waste in the world. To kick off this session, I am joined remotely by Antoine Arnett, who is the CEO of Belletti at LVHM. He supervises all image and environmental related issues, and as well as being, uh, as well as that role, he is the CEO of Belletti, uh, the Paris-based company specializing in upscale shoes, accessories, and ready-to-wear for men, uh, ready-to-wear men's since 2012. Antoine, welcome. It's good to have you here today. Thanks for joining us here at Change Now. How are you doing? Hello, very well. Thank you. Can so you hear me well? I can hear you absolutely loud and clear. It's, a, it's irritating that I didn't get to meet you here in the flesh, but wonderful to be able to meet you in any way. In any way. And thanks for sharing your time with us here Thank today. You. Can you tell us a little bit about the brand and organization for those who might not know quite so much? Uh, yes. Well, thank you. First of all, let me tell you how happy I am to, to be here and to be involved in, uh, in change now. I came a couple of years ago and uh, hopefully, indeed, I'll be able to, to meet with you all in, uh, in the near future. Um, I'm, I'm personally very convinced of the importance of, uh, of forums such as Change Now and uh, in um, stimulating creativity and, and driving these, uh, these forces forward. So. Um, a little bit about uh, us. Uh, my name is Antoine Arnaud. I'm responsible for the environmental strategy of LVMH Group, uh, as well as the group's image. I also am in charge, as you said, of uh, Berluti, uh, ready-to-wear and shoe maker since uh, 1895. Uh, LVMH, it's uh, 75 um, iconic maisons, if I shall put it that way. Many of them, uh, most of you, I think, know, such as Louis Vuitton, Christian Dior, in fashion, but uh, also in, in wines and spirits. We have a very renowned names, such as uh, Hennessy, Ruinard, um, but also in perfumes and cosmetics. We have uh, Guerlain or Parfum, Christian Dior, for example, but also in um, watches and jewelry. We have Chaumet, we have Bulgari, um, more recently, Tiffany, the American beautiful brand, just joined us. So th that is just to name a few. And uh, we're operating in a wide range of sectors, so fashion, perfume, cosmetics, but also um, selective distribution. We have a, a big brand called Sephora. Uh, and more recently, in the hotels. So my job is to make sure that uh, we continue to work towards greater awareness for these brands, but also greater accountability vis-à-vis uh, -vis environment, vis-à-vis -vis nature and, uh, and climate change. So this means, of course, working on the way we select our raw materials and we manufacture our products. Um, and just to uh, say it a little bit bluntly, it's not a topic that uh, um, we discovered uh, when Greta went to the UN. It's something that we've been working on for over 25 years now. Uh, we've had an environmental department uh, since 1992. Um, and I believe that um, this topic is now very much at the forefront of the news, especially since the pandemic. But uh, I, for one thing, that the, the, this global health crisis has uh, amplified our need to protect the environment. Um, so we've recently stepped up our own efforts with the announcement of a, a new, very ambitious uh, environmental strategy called Life360, but I think we'll, we'll go to that a little bit later. It's awesome to hear that you've been in this space for so long because, as you know, circular economy and, and recycling and reusing, especially in fashion, it's become almost like a buzz term at the moment. So can you tell us a little bit more about, in the context of the work that you're doing, some of the things that you're doing at LVMH? Uh, so circular economy um, is an interesting economic model because it uh, sort of reconciles the protection of natural resources with growth. Uh, we are, are 
clearly uh, into a growth model and, and uh, this um, French uh, word of décroissance is something that irritates our ear because we believe we can reconcile uh, growth and sustainability. So it's a model that makes total sense for us also because our products are highly dependent on nature. I mean, we cannot uh, uh, drink champagne without grapes. You, know, you will not have perfumes without flowers. There's no leather without cows. And uh, our responsibility is to take care of these natural resources, to give back to nature what we borrow from it, uh, and to, as much as we can, enhance the sustainability of these products. Uh, and it goes very well with uh, what luxury is. Uh, luxury is a very sustainable industry. Um, these products are meant to be kept uh, and are not meant to be uh, thrown away. So that's why we decided to make circular economy a key pillar of our program Life360. Uh, and at LVMH, we talk more about creative circularity because um, we see it as a, as a new source of inspiration for our designers rather than a constraint. It's a really, I love the way that you look at that as a source of inspiration for designers rather than constraint and that the luxury market, contrary to popular belief, is about creating things that you keep for a long period of time and so sustainability is baked into it whereas I think the popular belief is almost, it, it's throwing, it, it's not respecting nature which, which I love to hear is the complete opposite. Can you give us, and I think you've alluded a little bit to it, but can you give us some concrete examples of the sorts of things that you've been doing doing um, in, in the context of circular economy? Can you, can you tell us some of these creative circularity initiatives that you have? Uh, absolutely. So there are, there are several, there are countless actually. So a, 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 few, a few of them, um, probably one of the most um, uh, recognized one and most visible ones was uh, Virgil Abloh at Louis Vuitton when he uh, raised the profile of upcycling with his new collection of sneakers. Um, and in that collection, he actually fused the brand logo with the logo of circular economy. So it's not only symbolic, it's also, uh, uh, it's also something that, uh, that we use. It, in a little bit of a marketing way, but, uh, you know, if it works uh, for circular economy and if it works to raise awareness around these, uh, these topics, then we're all for it. Um, another example is uh, our internal activist, Stella McCartney, who joined the group uh, a little bit more than a couple of years ago. Um, well, she's made the circular economy a, a fundamental of her model, and, uh, and she chose very early on to uh, echo design, and, and it's, uh, it's how she works. It's the only way that she works, and, and, uh, and you know, her customers are, are drawn to her brand because of it. And for example, she's refusing to use um, any material from regions that are threatened by deforestation. Uh, but in smaller brands also, um, in a brand called Petou, um, the brand has very specific objective to uh, avoid waste. Uh, Céline, as well, has launched a project to recycle its uh, leather scrap. At Berluti, uh, which I, I know well and that uh, uh, where, where I try to uh, uh, enhance those uh, initiatives. Uh, we've asked an artist to uh, recover the leather scraps and, and use them to make furniture for the Belmont Hotel. So you see there's also this sort of mutualization of uh, sustainable ideas inside our, our group. Um, I don't know, Hennessy has integrated Eco Design into the entire development process for its new products where all um, departments of Hennessy are, are working together, the marketing, the purchasing, the packaging, the development, the environment. Um, and recently at group level, we've launched uh, an initiative called Nona Source, which is a fabric trading platform between our maison, where um, one brand has not used all the fabric that it was supposed to, and another can come and, and use it. And it's also open to young designers who can uh, uh, come and for a very, very low cost, buy that fabric for their uh, collections. So th these are just a few examples, but um, there are many others and we're, we're very serious about it. Wow. I mean, that 
I, I'm blown away seeing as you just literally scraped the surface of some of the things that you're doing. And those initiatives are broad. Uh, they're using recycling principles. You're looking at the waste and what do we do with that? How do we make it available to young designers as well as other parts of the group? So many creative ideas and so many creative initiatives in the way that you're implementing, which is I mean, I, I'm astounded because I think it's the sort of thing that a lot of people perhaps just don't even know is happening. So I'm really happy that you've been able to come here today and share that. Um, I also hear uh, that you've been providing products with a second life through repair, repair services. Is that correct? Oh, yes. Uh, and, and forever, uh, in a way. I mean, uh, uh, our, our customers trust our brands and buy our products also because of it. Uh, it allows us to maintain a, a real trust relationship with our clients. Uh, at Berluti, it's a bit different because part of the history of the shoe is that you buy it, but you can come and change the color. So you come to repatinate it, and, and a red shoe becomes a green shoe, or a green shoe becomes a brown shoe. Uh, so that's, it's more a gimmick to have our, our clients come back, but at the same time, they can have it repaired. Um, all our watch brands also uh, uh, propose that uh, uh, service of a, of a second life. And at Louis Vuitton, I mean, I've worked there for, for more than 10 years. Basically, your, your product is guaranteed for life. So, yes, it's something that's um, part of the success of our uh, industry, but it's also part of the moral contract that we have with our customers. And they know when they come to a luxury brand that they're not going to buy something that's going to get used and that you're going to have to throw away the next season. To the opposite, it's a, it's a product that you'll keep for life and that's why we, um, we, can, we can affirm and we can uh, say with pride that our industry is a very sustainable and durable one. I mean, I love that. I absolutely love it. Because at the beginning, you said luxury is all about creating something that you can use for a long period of time. And we do have this developing culture of almost throwaway materials in fashion, especially the opposite side of luxury, where you can get things at incredibly affordable, dare I say, cheap prices, where people feel like they can just keep buying new things. So the, the idea of being able to repair, or in the case of Baluti, come in and repurpose, rejuvenate, change the color of something you already love, you know? We're bored of black, let's make those shoes blue. You know, it, those ideas no. are really exciting to me. Um, look, engaging in the circular economy, um, initiatives can also apply to new products and new solutions that, or using less polluting materials. Can you tell me a little bit about how, if at all, you're applying this in terms of the, the materials that you're using? Uh, of course. Well, all of our maisons are bursting with imagination uh, for that. And let me tell you that um, we don't have to push our designers or our marketing teams to, um, to be on the first step of that ladder. They're already up there. And, um, and it's not difficult to push them because uh, they actually don't need to be pushed. They're already um, uh, you know, on the dance floor. They're all for it. So yes, we have uh, many of our maisons who are at the cutting edge of, of innovation when it, it comes to creating new materials. Um, and they innovate, but they also follow demand. Uh, to be honest, it's what our customers want. So uh, we're at the same time trying to create something new, something good, um, but also we're following what customers are asking for. So, uh, for example, some of our maisons are partnering with specialized companies to create new materials. Garlin uh, works with a startup who, which creates um, new materials composed of at least 70% of natural materials. And at LVMH, we also support all of our maisons by offering trainings um, provided by our, our internal uh, academy um, by making these tools available and uh, by creating, more recently it was online uh, materials um, um, in a library called Matière à Penser, which um, enables all our brands to come and choose between 500 sustainable uh, materials that are very adapted for this uh, cause. Oh my, like the, 
You're blowing me away with the sheer volume, honestly, the sheer volume of what you're doing. And, and I love hearing that it's part of the fabric of your business, that um, you're not having to push the designers to, here's some materials mm. that could be reused, please incorporate them in our designs. Um, but you've got that, the demand from your, cust your consumers and the creativity of your designers who are more than willing to dive in and use some of these new technologies. That Absolutely. being said, I'm pretty sure it's not always easy to take on um, circular or creative economy type principles. Can you share maybe some of the challenges with implementing circularity? So the, the main challenge uh, is to make desirable products um, while remaining environmentally friendly. Um, let me explain this. Sometimes you, you think you have a good idea, you think you have a good material, but the hand isn't just right. Um, so you need to um, not jump into the water without testing it first. Um, however, we're willing to um, embark on this journey with our teams, but also with the customers. And um, I, I think the most exciting thing about creative circularity is that we're forging, we're creating this new kind of luxury that is respectful of nature uh, and that simultaneously protects it and celebrates it. Um, the biggest challenge for us is going to be how can we systematize it? How can we implement it at every level in our maison? Um, how can we make highly successful products um, that are 100% sustainable? And it requires us to break certain habits and uh, um, to systematically measure our impact, which is something that's more difficult to do than it seems. Um, and then to source responsibly and, uh, and carry all our, all our suppliers with us. And uh, that's also difficult because, of course, we produce most of our products, but we also work with a lot of suppliers that need to be um, as responsible as we are. It's a complex problem and it's one that we do all need to get behind and it's exciting that large organizations um, like yours are taking on this challenge and encouraging suppliers as well to get involved because if you can, if you can find that sweet spot where you've got something that people desire and you're able to encourage have this ripple effect of encouraging others to get on the same train as you, we really do have um, the opportunity to see some significant transformations in the way that fashion, we engage with fashion going forward. So what would you say to others who've been watching this and are thinking of perhaps kicking off certain similar sorts of initiatives for themselves? Is there any, any insights or wisdom you can share with them? Uh, listen, no, uh, I, it would be too pretentious of me to, to give uh, wisdom, uh, but I can, I can give you a few things I'd like to share, which are, first of all, um, my optimism, because I, I firmly believe that the circular economy is the right model to address. And I, I know, because I see it every day with the, the teams, there is a, a it's not even it's not even a consensus it's a unanimity around the fact that everybody wants to embark on that ship so i'm very optimistic about that and and second of all my enthusiasm uh, because circular economy leads to innovation and i feel there's so much left to invent especially in new materials and less uh, waste less wasteful manufacturing process that uh, i feel we're we're not almost there, but uh, we're at least halfway into this journey. So, um, uh, and last little piece of advice I would, I would give is um, don't hesitate to partner up with suppliers or to build alliances, even sometimes with competitors. And that's uh, probably the most effective way to create process. You know, very recently, we just announced a partnership with um, very important competitors. We have a word in French, which is confrère, which is uh, our brothers. I don't, I don't really know the word in the, in the, the word, sorry, in, the, in English, but uh, it's maybe a nicer word than competitors. So we announced a partnership with Prada, with Cartier, and a, with a few other brands. And, and uh, um, this project is open to 
any competitor who wants to join, small or big. And um, its plan is to bring blockchain tracking and transparency into the heart of luxury. It's a, 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 a bit of a technical tool, but when you look into it, it's going to be a great one to avoid counterfeiting uh, and to avoid many issues that our industry is, uh, is um, a victim of. So uh, it's, a, it's a good tool, and by pooling our expertise and experience together, uh, I think we can go forward, mu forward much quicker. And um, last, sorry, I would, I would like to uh, say it's important to share expertise and savoir-faire with uh, the new generation and, and uh, the students uh, and the ones who are learning right now. So that's why we launched um, a month ago, a little bit more than a month ago now, a partnership program with Central St. Martins. Um, it's called Maison Zero for Regenerative Luxury. And uh, the goal of this program is to empower emerging talents uh, through creative education to, um, to respond to these environmental emergencies and to, to better design and to know how to better design for a better future. So the CSM students have been uh, very imaginative and, uh, and already I think this is a, uh, a good partnership. Incredible. I mean, you said you don't have any wisdom and then bombarded us with wisdom. So, <laughs> so I don't believe that. I think there's a huge amount of wisdom there and a lot of awesome resources you shared as well for those who are watching and want to go and check them out. That's all we've got time for in this particular section. Antoine from LVHM, thank you so much for joining us today and for thank your you. time. See ya. Thank you. <laughs> for our next segment, um, we'll be moving on to a very quick session around from the CEO and founder of TerryCycle. Uh, he's a global leader in collection, collecting and repurposing complex waste. Please welcome Tom Saki. Thanks so much for having me. It's a real uh, pleasure uh, to be here uh, in, this, uh, in, in, in this setting and to be able to address everyone. Um, I'm excited to share with you uh, uh, what we have been up to uh, over the uh, past year since uh, we last had a chance to present a change now, and especially the insights that we're learning around the circular economy and how that's adjusting uh, during this time uh, of pandemic. So to jump right in, um, as a little bit of background, uh, uh, the organization I operate, TerraCycle, uh, is on a mission to eliminate the idea of waste. And we are essentially, if you will, a waste management organization. Uh, today, uh, the company operates in uh, 22 countries around the world, uh, focusing in two markets as a nonprofit organization in Thailand and India, and then everywhere else as a mission-driven for-profit organization. Now, in the journey of a circular economy, we really begin with you know, objects that are linear, products that uh, uh, today end up uh, uh, as waste uh, uh, after uh, a number of uses. And so the first question uh, in this is, of course, how do we start bending this and start creating an, a circular economy based on uh, a recycling, uh, uh, being able to collect and recycle just about anything that's out there? I think one of the interesting things, especially now, uh, having uh, living through uh, uh, the pandemic and a lot of the shifts, is that during this time we are consuming, depending on the statistics you read, anywhere from 30 to 50 percent more disposable goods. But we're also recycling less. And when you think about what allows that then to occur, what makes something recyclable is can a waste management company make money? You know, can, is, are the costs of collecting a certain waste stream and processing it more than the value of that material, which will make it not recyclable, uh, or less than the value of the material, which would make it recyclable. And why I think it's important to always look at this question is it really clearly shows what's been happening to it. You know, in 2018, many countries stopped importation of waste, and that made it very difficult for recyclers uh, to maintain their businesses. 40% of end markets disappeared. Also, what we feed our waste, you know, packaging, for example, continuously gets lighter, thinner, uh, which makes it less profitable to recycle. And then finally, oil prices, uh, that's the orange line in this particular chart, have been decreasing. Uh, and uh, when oil goes down, the value of materials uh, uh, go down like polymers. And that also has been challenging. So there's been a lot of uh, headwind, if you will, uh, for recyclers. And the way that shows up in the teal colored line, as you can see there, is uh, uh, cities have moved from making money on recycling to losing money on recycling all over the world. So 
what, what we've done at TerraCycle, whether it's cigarette recycling uh, that is now live in 400 cities around the world, all the way to you know, aerosol containers uh, into exercise parks or uh, flip-flops into playgrounds, uh, 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 has been to try to think about how do you bring the philosophy of recycling and business models to just about anything. A big trend we're seeing that has really emerged in the past six months, you know, whether it's manifested through personal protective equipment uh, recycling all the way to dirty diaper recycling, this is live in Amsterdam and soon launching in France and Japan, is that retailers are shifting their point of view from being sort of peripheral on the question of recycling to significantly more interest in being the place where people take recycled materials, whether it's car seats at retailers like Target uh, or Walmart, or whether running even more ambitious kiosks, uh, like this is DM in Germany, uh, uh, or even massive platforms like what recently uh, uh, we brought live with Asda in the UK. So I think a real shift uh, at the moment in this first sort of journey on the circular economy we've seen, especially during the pandemic, is retailers are really focused on uh, uh, being a part of the recycling supply chain and much more open to these concepts of, for example, in-store recycling and, and uh, how they can be a part of that solution. We've also, uh, 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 in the past year, launched a foundation because we've noticed that it is very important to bring these solutions to emerging markets as well. In Thailand last year, we pulled half a million pounds of river plastic out of the rivers uh, through a foundation model. And that gets us really to the first part of the circular economy, which is how do we collect and recycle things? Of course, the next part is how do we help companies make their objects from waste or recycled materials? And a big sort of insight that we've learned here a big trend is this challenge that many organizations are out there looking to use recycled content, but they're all using the same stuff. So in the world of, say, PET, the type of plastic that makes up a soda bottle, whether you're making a backpack or a T-shirt or a shampoo bottle or a carpet, it all tends to be municipally sourced or city sourced beverage containers that make that up because that is the material that behaves the most uh, in characteristic of price and performance as virgin materials. And so that leaves a big problem, right? While there's this great demand for that material, there's simply not enough of it to go around. And so, uh, and that leaves our rivers, our lakes, our oceans, our natural parks, our, our inner cities, Aboriginal communities still covered in waste. And this has to do again with the yes. fact that these materials, cleaning up materials like this, cost yes. more to collect and produce lower quality outputs. So what we have noticed here in the, the long-term solution that we all must think about here is how do we design products uh, to be able to embrace what waste uh, uh, is out there the care and in the characteristics of waste uh, in in what waste can be produced into and what price has to be spent so that uh, uh, everything can be cleaned up in the short term a way to unlock this issue is leveraging the power of narrative uh, whether it's from uh, the bottom of our oceans turning into shampoo bottles or even now working with uh, luxury uh, watch companies to clean up the top of Mount Everest. Uh, uh, and there, at least, the power of narrative can help do a short-term unlock while we think about more systemic solutions. As we think about the circular economy, we've described here a circular economy based on recycling. Of course, the, this is not the end point. The next step is to think about how do we tighten that circle to get to a circular economy based on reuse. And so I was actually very proud that uh, in, in the last time I had a chance to be on stage at Change Now, we were sharing that we were launching a platform uh, called Loop, um, which actually launched for the first time in the world in France and, very, uh, 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 and was debuted formally uh, at the World Economic Forum. Now, uh, Loop, uh, uh, since uh, then, has now gone live uh, in U.S., Canada, the U.K., and just uh, two days ago also launched in Japan. We have launches in Australia and Germany coming up very soon. The idea of Loop is simple. It's how do we shift from uh, 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 products and packages that we own and become disposable to products and packages that we borrow and securitize through a deposit mechanism uh, uh, and then are cleaned and sold to a different consumer. Ideally, making a platform that feels like disposability while acting reusable. And so the learnings we've learned since the platform has gone live is that Yes, consumers are, are excited. We've seen results be phenomenal across the board. But why are they excited is a very interesting learning. Some consumers are excited because these uh, packages are now fully reusable. But many are excited because they perceive that their product is healthier, for example, when packaged not in plastic, but glass or alloys. 
But there is also uh, a great desire for the elevation of premiumness, uh, you know, higher quality materials being used, uh, 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 even maybe more function. Now, we have seen many companies look at their his history because there's a great history in reusable packaging. And even organizations like retailers look at their private label products. Now, the big development that's very exciting to share with you that has all happened during the pandemic is not uh, just how brands have joined the platform, now 150 major consumer product companies as a part of the system, but how retailers have moved from uh, online testing platforms as we began with to now deploying in physical store environments. Carrefour has been leading the way on this. Uh, uh, first retailer to launch with Loop, uh, not just online, but also now the first retailer to bring Loop in store. This is now live in Paris stores, uh, uh, whether for uh, uh, non-temperature controlled products from shampoo to Nutella, to temperature controlled products like uh, Dan and Yogurt and soon other products. And this has now paved the way where 10 major retailers around the world are now launching in store later this year. It, it creates a more convenient consumer experience where consumers can purchase what they wish and then return to a bin at the front of the store to get their deposits back. And then that packaging goes effectively into the waste management function of reuse where we check it in, clean it, uh, and then provide it back to brands to refill. And what started in France has now become a global movement, uh, live in, uh, uh, as mentioned, five countries around the world with two more coming soon. But one of the biggest learnings we have uh, 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 learned is what matters to consumers in accessing new systems like this? And so, you know, many times traditionally folks ask the question, are you going to pay more for a sustainable product? But I think it's the wrong question based on the learnings we've had. Because the first and most important thing to consumers is convenience and convenience above all else. Then if the system is convenient enough, they're willing to then uh, 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 look at what the features and benefits are. And then Depending on those features and benefits, they will look at the price and see if all that is reasonable. And why convenience is so important is this very striking statistic. We're actually launching reusable uh, diapers in the Loop ecosystem in the U.S. in a few months. But today, 50 to 85 percent of American, French, German and British parents try reusable diapers. It's a massive amount of trial. But only 2 to 3 percent stick with it, which is a very low amount of repeat. So at least the way Loop is trying to, to solve this major issue in reuse of convenience is to try to create a platform where you can buy anywhere and return anywhere. So not only can you, you know, buy uh, the examples that you saw at, at uh, grocery stores like Tesco or Carrefour uh, uh, or Kroger uh, all the way to Eon, but you'll soon see uh, 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 McDonald's launching with Loop or Burger King. When the important aspect here is that you'll be able to buy your reusable, say, uh, hamburger and uh, uh, soda and then drop it off in a different retailer. Create an ecosystem of buy anywhere and return anywhere. Because for me, I think the potential of reuse is massive, not just for sustainability, but for innovation. Yes, packaging, like this is a recent launch we just had in Japan with Ajinomoto just a few days ago, of spice and coffee packaging and beautiful, uh, functional, reusable packaging. But because the package is no longer a property of the consumer, but something they borrow, it can be even upgraded functionally. They uh, are now impregnating temperature and humidity sensors directly into the package so that you can find out how fresh your content is. This, to me, is what uh, the future that a reusable ecosystem ushers in, where the future of consumption is not just more sustainable, but it's significantly upgraded from uh, uh, the way we experience and enjoy our products today. So hopefully that gives you a little taste in how we're trying to eliminate the idea of waste. Thank you. Tom, as always, what an incredible, what incredible insights and huge congratulations for the work that you've been doing with Loop. I know you were here last year launching Loop and telling us that it's just getting out there into the market. And so it's really exciting to hear about the results that you've had in that time frame since things have gone live. Um, so thank you so much for joining us here, albeit remotely. We're missing you here in Paris. Hopefully we'll be able to have you back here in person next year. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and we wish you all all the best. For those people who want to find out more, you can head over to Terry Cycles website or indeed have a have a look around the Change Now website as well to find out more information about Loop and what Terry Cycle are up to. Thanks again, Tom, for your time today. Thanks for having me.
So moving on to the final segment of this particular session, and we're going to be diving into examples of a few different companies who are doing some incredible things in the space of the circular economy. Joining me here today, first, you know, I'm going to go in no particular order. We've got one live in the studio and a couple people joining us remotely. But joining us here, we've got, well, let's see who comes up first. So we've got Pierre, who is um, the CEO of Nopla, which is an edible packaging company. We've also got joining us remotely, Carmen Ejose, who is the founder and chief innovation executive officer at Anana Ananas and Anam, my mouth, my mouth is full with so many A's today, and also the European Inventor Award finalist for Pintex, which is a natural plant-based material made from pineapple. And last but absolutely not least, joining us here in the studio, we've got 24-year-old founder and CEO of Zeta Shoes. So thank you, welcome to the seg this segment. Wonderful. It's wonderful to have all of you here and very, ex very exciting times indeed. Now, there's so much going on right now in terms of the material, the particular um, work that each of you are doing. You've got such inventive solutions in terms of the circular economy, and I probably didn't do them sufficient, sufficient justice in the introduction. So, Pierre, would you like to start by kicking us off and telling us a little bit more about the work that you're doing? Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me. Um, so Notpla, we are a sustainable packaging startup based in London, and we develop uh, alternatives to single-use plastic using seaweed. Uh, we think it's a material that has a, a huge potential in terms of uh, the circular economy um, because it's such a, a renewable resource, uh, but also has a very easy end of life. Uh, it's been around for 100 million years, so wherever it might end up, it's not going to create uh, long-lasting waste. And we've been using seaweed for creating um, a few different solutions <coughs> to um, single use, kind of like on the consumption. So our first product uh, was a, oh, a little bubble that contained liquids. And in that case, uh, you can literally eat the packaging. It's a bit like eating a fruit. Um, and we've been using this for hydration at marathons. We've been using it for cocktails at festivals uh, and more recently launching it for uh, doses of ketchup and mayo for the takeaway uh, kind of market. And realizing the potential of seaweed, we've started to apply our seaweed as a coating onto cardboard for food boxes. Um, so we're launching uh, a food box for uh, takeaway with uh, just in the UK, as well as future applications, uh, such as kind of like sachets and bags for dry products. So we think that seaweed has a lot of uh, potential for being a substitute for a lot of the kind of like the more uh, disposable um, solutions out there. Wow, seaweed as packaging. Uh, so, Wari, tell us a little bit about what you're doing. You've got, are you wearing the shoes? Of course I am, I'm promoting them. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit more about your shoes and the product that you've created. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I'm the happy founder of Zeta. Zeta is a zero waste uh, sneakers brand made exclusively from uh, recycled, recyclable and vegan materials such as grape waste, uh, recycled plastic, recycled cork or uh, rubber. The shoes are ethically made in Portugal um, in, a, in a small factory and uh, as we didn't want that pair of shoes to be um, an additional waste at the end of the cycle, we propose to uh, recycle them for free um, in a sorting plant in order to uh, create um, a second life to, to be a green combustible, green fuel. So you have literally taken the recycling concept to like a whole nother level. So the materials are recycled and then the shoes at the end, when you finish using them or they, they get to the point, you know, you can't wear shoes forever, then they're recycled again. Uh, Carmen, you are using pineapple to create something that's similar to leather. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, thank you, Lovelda, and thank you, Change Now, for having me there. Yes, uh, Piatex is a plant based material uh, which is made from pineapple leaf fibers. It's the waste of the pineapple harvest. And it can be used as an alternative to leather and petroleum based textiles in the fashion industry, particularly footwear and accessories. 
but also in interiors and some in automotive industry. So it's a very versatile product using a waste from agriculture. The ideas are incredible and the implementation that they're out there in the world right now I think is super exciting. So please do go and check out each of these inventions. That being said, developing new solutions for established markets, because none of you have gone into markets that are brand new. You're not, you know, you're, you're, you're in there in the fashion sector, you're rivaling with other plastic and, and materials. Like, what did you need to consider in order to get your idea from something in your mind to something that's, that people are gonna accept, use, and make good use out of? Um, Carmen, we'll start with you. Yeah, I think developing new <laughs> solutions takes creativity, but also it needs to have a vision and a purpose. I think this is really very important as creators, you know, what is the purpose? And the purpose has to be for a better future for all of us, including the planet. And this is the way I created Pinatex, and this is the way Ananas and uh, my company works. And this being said, having said this, the product has to be right for the market, right? Uh, which market we have to know, uh, is our purpose aligned with what is needed in the market? This is really very important as well. Does it perform well? Um, is there a demand? Can we deliver? Key to me and I think to, to the development of a new product is partnerships. You know, how are we going to work with somebody else's? Are our values aligned as well? Um, I think these are really the main things that you have to look into uh, bringing something into the market. Great things to consider. Are your values aligned? Does the market want it? Laurie, how do you work out if the market wants recycled shoes? Was that something you had to consider? Yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean, um, I think the most important thing is um, to answer a, de a demand and not to create a demand. Uh, in my case, I noticed that uh, a lot of shoe brands were uh, using natural or ecological materials. Uh, but not uh, fully recycled. Uh, so it means that uh, they needed to create uh, materials um, or to take it uh, from natural resources. Uh, the idea was really uh, to use waste and not creating any, uh, any materials to make a, a design and fashionable product. Um, so I think the most important is really to study the market and to think, okay, is my product uh, uh, needed uh, or am I creating a demand? We live like in a... Uh, fast consuming uh, society where we buy too much, where we produce too much. Um, now I think we really need to create products that are needed. So does the market want it? Are we creating a demand or finding a demand? Pierre, you went into a market plastic, you know, you're rivaling plastic. So we know people want something plastic related, but it's so existing and people have cheap, cheap ways of currently accessing what they, you know, their requirements. So what did you need to consider in terms of bringing your solution to market? I think in our case, um, and, and echoing what Carmen was saying, there is definitely this need to understand what the material can do. And I think uh, we're not going to have a, a silver bullet. We're not going to find one material that's going to replace every single piece of plastic out there. So we need to be less lazy in the design phase and identify exactly the opportunities for specific materials. And in this case, I think natural materials have a huge role to play if we want to get out of like synthetic uh, kind of like indestructible materials. Um, to, to, to really zoom in on those applications where it makes sense to have um, like such material used. So I think in our case, we're really looking at um, changing the behavior in places out of home where we know that the, there is the, the highest chance of littering, there is the lowest chance of collecting and be able to kind of like reuse those kind of like uh, materials. And that, that's where we think that uh, something as biodegradable as seaweed has a role to play. But um, we, we, we don't want to be working against all the other solutions such as Obviously, like re reducing uh, packaging where it's not needed, but also uh, reusing packaging uh, where we have the systems in place and, and, and using certain materials uh, for the right application. So getting really specific about the actual pain point you're going to solve rather than 
Derek, like, there's, a, there's a term we have in English, trying to boil the ocean, like seeing if you can solve all problems at once, but getting really clear on, there's lots of different problems here, which one do I really wanna hone in on? It, so my next question's somewhat linked. Um, there's lots of people with solutions, especially right now, the, the idea of circular economy, reusing, recycling, making better use of existing materials or natural materials has become quite popular. But many of those ideas don't make it out. Like they just never get out into the world. So I'm really curious to understand what you think some of the success factors are that have been key to to you being able to make your ideas work. Laurie, I want to start with you. I mean, you launched your business very young, um, just before, well, in the middle of a pandemic. So what is it that you think really supported you in being able to get your shoes out into the market? I think um, the, product, the product just came at the right time, like just after the pandemic. Uh, people started to think about uh, about their, uh, their, their purchase, how to purchase better, how to purchase um, ethically. Um, so it just came at that moment um, uh, at some, there were some uh, environmental um, consciousness, I think. Uh, so it came at the right moment and also something that was super important for us was transparency. There is a lack of transparency from brands now. Um, and we don't hide anything. And I think the customer, the consumer understood it. We, 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 we tell everything about composition, sourcing, um, uh, fabrication, everything. Um, so I think transparency was the key in our case. Yeah, being really, really super transparent about your values, not hiding behind them, putting that front and center of what you do and leaning into it, not, not having it as a secondary, it's this is what we're about. Pierre, what, what do you think's made it, made it successful for you to get Nopla out into the market? What, what were your success criteria? Well, I think um, it's a journey and like the mission will be accomplished when we start having a dip on the overall global kind of like consumption of single-use plastic. So we are very, very far from having reached that scale. That being said, we are super excited to be well into this journey. I think it's all about kind of like um, finding the, the enablers for the next phase. Um, and we need so many more um, alternative materials. We, we need so many more other startups and innovators because we need that diversity. If you look at nature, not every, uh, like no fruit is exactly the same. You need a, a, a diversity so that we have a choice. And I think that um, in our case, um, what was really important is to get people excited about the, like, the thing we create. Um, when we first put the videos out there, the fact that like people could see that you could eat your packaging that was so different. It was not hiding behind some kind of bio-based or bioplastics. It was literally from the world of uh, fruits and vegetables. So having something that really captures people's Im imagination, it's enabling you to be in, uh, in that different category and then to get people behind it. So being creative, being innovative, something, you know, eating, eat your, you know, don't just grab your, eat, eat your packaging as a completely different way of kind of throwing things out there. So having some sort of creative way of putting yourself into the market. Cameron, you are like, Carmen, you, you are a finalist for a European inventor of the year. So firstly, congratulations. But secondly, what do you think has been the key to your success in getting your solution out into the world? Yes, uh, that's really the key question. Um, in Ananasram, we have a product that brings a solution, particularly to the fashion market, because Pinatex is the most sustainable plant-based material commercially available at scale today. And this is, as you were saying, it's really quite difficult for a small company to really bring something, you know, up there, commercially available at the scale, and this is really what we are working on very strongly at the moment. Uh, but also Pinatex, Pinatex is, is unique in the world, and so is the story of Pinatex, you know. We have a strong vicious vision and a purpose, uh, which is to heal the relationship between people and planet. I think it's so important that you have a purpose, and 
this purpose has to be real and has to be needed as well. And people 100% relate to our purpose because, you know, it's real. And I think this is both uh, both things about Pinatex being unique and also the purpose is what makes us quite successful. Because I'm really loving this conversation. but. Let's put it this way, there are your, the solutions you've all created are incredible and we need more solutions like this out there in the world. What do you think is the route to getting solutions, alternative solutions, a circular economy approach out into the world such that solutions like yours become the mainstream rather than a side thing that people are, you know, just ticking the like, look, I'm being eco-friendly box, but it becomes part of the fabric of how we do business. Pierre, how do we get more people eating their, fa eating their material? What do we need to do? So I think there's a few elements. Um, one which um, everyone can contribute is really calling out brands when you think that they are not doing the best they can. Because I think over the past five years, we've seen a radical change in how important they now kind of like uh, care and like they are constantly their finger on the pulse of like reaction of consumers. And um, it does change the conversations, the nature of the conversation. So I think that the brands have a huge role to play in kind of like adopting and testing out those kind of alternatives and, and scaling them uh, together. So I think um, we all have this opportunity to, to, to be a voice to add up to that list of people who say, hey, I'm not satisfied with the products I'm able to purchase for the things that I want in my, in my life. And I think the, the second one that is really encouraging is seeing uh, that there is um, a lot of kind of like uh, private capital that is being invested in innovations that is also being invested in non-traditional solutions. So it's not just about recycling, it's not just about the old models, but like um, people who are willing to kind of take some risk and, and try to develop something that's gonna really be able to change the system. So I think this combination is, is really helpful for nurturing uh, more innovators, um, getting more chances for them to jump to the next phase. So, if you're watching, you've got an opportunity to help to make this shift if you go out and start to use your voice more broadly. But there's also a lot of funding available now for quite unique solutions too. Carmen, what about you? What are your plans to get, um, to get Pintex out to a wider group of people? What's needed such that this becomes something we're seeing as a regular material on our high streets? Well, I think we are really working on it at the moment uh, because what is needed is to make sure that we've got a supply chain uh, that really responds to the demands of the market. Uh, and if I have to say is that there was no supply chain for Pinatex, we had to build everything. Uh, we work with uh, farming communities. So we have to bring from the farming community knowledge, skills, relationships, you know, then into the textile um, industry when we do the finishing and then into the product, you know, the product out into the market. So to build this and to build it in a way that is transparent and it really brings social and ecological responsibility, this is very, very important for us. So it's a, it's a supply chain thing, and I think that's something that's, yes. that's worth being aware of. It's not just about having, you know, back to success factors. It's not just about having yeah. a great material, but it's got to be able to produ be produced consistently at scale mm -hmm. and that there is, there's um, the same understanding and knowledge throughout the whole supply chain. Um, so, Laurie, what about you? How do we get more fashionable recycled shoes? <laughs> Complicated question. <laughs> um, I think like nowadays, big brands and multinationals are trying to integrate environmental and social values into their, their products. Um, but this is purely greenwashing. Uh, I think it will become mainstream global when they will put um, environmental responsibility as a, cre as a key priority instead of only profits, only benefits. Um, as, a, as a young company, as a young company with strong environmental values, I think what is the, the, the hardest um, is to, uh, keep, um, to keep the core values uh, intact 
uh, while making volume. Like in nine months, uh, we sold near than uh, 4,000 pair of shoes, which is just incredible. But at the same time, I'm thinking, how can I keep these values that I, that I try to, to implement at the beginning intact without uh, compromising environment, without compromising people making the shoes, without negligating a human. So that's one of my biggest uh, goals. To, to be able to get something out without compromising values. You know what? We are fresh out of time. It's so frustrating because I was really thoroughly enjoying this conversation. Pierre, Carmen, Laurie, thank you so much for nice. joining us here today and for sharing your insights and wisdom. It's been an absolutely awesome session. Do stay with us here on Change Now for more. Um, go and go and have a look through the platform. There'll be more sessions available across the entire platform. And until next time, it's bye from me for now.